Howdy, Greg Swan here. This is the Church of Splendor, and I am so glad you could join me today. It's April 10th, 2016. This is the fourth anniversary of the publication of Man Alive, a book of philosophy that I wrote and made available for free at selfadoration.com essentially a summary of everything that I understand or understood about philosophy at that time. My understanding has grown since then, and to my surprise and delight, frankly, I thought I was done. I thought what I was writing was the end of my journey, and it turns out to have been a key turning point on that journey. I learned so much about what I think in writing Man Alive that it set me on... Um, a series of new intellectual adventures as a result of the intellectual lenses that I developed in writing Man Alive. Three cheers for me. It's a very um, succinct summary of the egoistic argument in Man Alive. Three cheers for me. I, in 1981 or so, someone asked me what I thought was the first law of philosophy, and my answer was me first me first. So if you go to a, um, an elementary school or something like that, a, a, any sort of place where you can find a whole lot of children together, there will be a competition to get at everything, but especially things like the water fountains or things like that. So you listen to the crowd of kids trying to get at the water fountain and you'll hear it again and again and again, me first, me first, me first. I am not arguing for a puerile kind of um, clamoring or elbowing for unearned advantage, but I do think that, um, do, do think, do believe, do know, can prove that you are in this all alone. I say that and people rebel against it. You're in this all alone. You're born alone and you die alone and people rebel against that because they insist that it makes no sense. Well, the way that it makes sense to me is inside your own cranium is a eager, active, self-aware, self-reflective intelligence, your mind, yourself, and that self is inside your cranium all alone. You are in this all alone. And that principle guided the writing of Man Alive, and it's guided me all my life, but ever better since the writing of Man Alive. Um, thousands of people have read the book Man Alive, Dozens have reacted to it. Almost no one has argued against it. The arguments against it, I think, have been really silly. There haven't been any intelligent, reasonable, rational, philosophical arguments against the philosophy presented in Man Alive. But I don't have the strong impression that too many people have benefited by the book, which is really a shame. I was um, writing to two people who feel themselves lost in the modern world, who realize at least viscerally, that they are in this all alone and are looking for guidance for how to manage the solitary pursuit of one's own values. And so I was really hoping to be strongly influential, and I haven't been. Um, I was also aware that the arguments that I'm making are contrary to virtually every philosophical argument that's ever been made, essentially every philosophical argument that's ever been made, but there are a couple of uh, near neighbors to me who might insist that we have more similarities than differences, and I'm not opposed to that. I'm a big fan of similarity. But I thoroughly expected to incite a whole lot of um, angry rejection displays, and in a certain degree, I courted them. Not too much, because I'm not a great believer in rancor and in the uh, Man Alive is really the first formal instance in my writing of an explicit attempt to make the affection to display. I was deliberately trying to um, recruit, not a movement, but um, a philosophical movement, to recruit people to my way of thinking. And so I didn't go out of my way to be deliberately alienating to people who uh, already are egoists to one degree or another, or who find the idea of egoism attractive. I was deliberately trying to attract those people. But in um, chapter 7 and 10, particularly, there are um, weaponized arguments that I thought would incite ugly, angry rejection displays, and that hasn't happened either. That Thousands of people have read the book. 
dozens have been influenced by it. Two or three have been, um, I think, have changed the course of their lives because of it, which I'm really grateful for. It may be more than two or three. I hope it is. Um, but the <laughs> response in general from the larger world has been extremely underwhelming to me, which is, okay. I mean, it's okay. I mean, the world is what it is. I don't fight existential reality. There is no alternative to the existential. Um, but I was deliberately trying to incite a very big conversation, and so far that has not happened at Boohoo. Three cheers for me, yeah, but three tears for me, too. And I can wash away those tears easily enough because it doesn't, doesn't mean anything to me. And, I, and yet, at the same time, I can really celebrate the victories that have accrued to me in terms of my understanding of the universe and also in terms of the work product that I've managed to produce in the last four years. As a result of Man Alive, I wrote two books of Willie stories. I've written other Willie stories in that time, but I wrote two short books of Willie stories, Sun City and Losing Slowly, um, very much informed by the arguments in Man Alive. I wrote three books of nonfiction, Father's Day, Nine Empathies, and Shiley's Delight, all of which are hugely informed by the arguments in Man Alive. Um, I completely eviscerated every pro-abortion argument on earth, but most particularly the libertarian objectivist slash libertarian arguments for abortion, completely eviscerated, completely destroyed them. Um, I wrote and made many, many, many hours of video on the subjects of love, sex, marriage, and family, and I think I've completely rehabilitated um, good antiquarian arguments for monogamy, chastity, marital fidelity, um, serious committed family life for the Greek hoplite idea of the father's role in the family. I have rehabilitated um, storgic love, a number of really good antiquarian arguments that were really badly defended, um, particularly defended in religion, but even when they're not defended in religion, they weren't well defended philosophically. I have done a lot of work in the last four years. And I can see my way forward to a lot more work, a lot more interesting things that I have to cover, uh, particularly beneficial to people who are egoists and um, tangentially and secondarily beneficial to people who are interested in liberty, freedom of action, freedom of conscience, freedom of intellect, freedom of speech, freedom of religion for that matter, for people who are interested in the freedom that people are always talking about and never doing anything about. I've provided what I think is very sound guidance for how to achieve liberty in your own life, regardless of what anyone else does, because you can't depend on other people to hew to your philosophical points of view. But I think I've provided very sound ways for committed self-responsible men in particular, because men are the leaders of human civilization, men are the leaders of their spouses, they are the leaders of their families, ways for men to reestablish the most important manifestations of political liberty in their own homes, in their own families, in their own lives, regardless of what anyone else does. I don't care for mainstream libertarian rhetoric I have almost nothing to do with it. I don't pay any attention to it. I don't argue with it. And I don't um, entertain the disputatious nature of that sort of thing. I don't have anything to do with atheists for the same reason, because I don't think that they're all that terribly interested in atheism. They're interested in pissing off people who disagree with them. And I don't have anything to do with that. I don't care for the contentious style of libertarian debate. I don't care for the whining and pissing and moaning about how the state done got me down. Um, I don't care for the we're all in this together argument that says we all have to enlist all of our neighbors before anything significant can change. I don't care for anything at all like that. And the reason is because you're in this all alone. I'm in this all alone. I can do whatever I can do to make my own life better. And I endeavor to do that in every way I can think of. 
You can do whatever you can do to make your own life better, and I entreat you to avail yourself of the work that I've been doing in order to learn better ways to make your own life better. But neither one of us can change anyone else's mind. I can't even change your mind. I've made hundreds of hours of video, mainly seen by only a few dozen people per episode. But my hope is that in the long run, thousands, millions, billions of people will see the videos that I've made, will read the books that I've written, will read the essays that I've written, will learn what I know. I hope that happens, but the only life I can actually change is my own. And that's really the only one I'm interested in changing. I hope to be of benefit to you. I truly do. And I'm not looking for anything in an exchange. This is a completely, you could argue it's an egoistic from my point of view, but I don't see it that way at all. I, I want to live in a better world. And the way that the world outside of my mind will get better in the large will be by the people around me making better choices, choosing to be better people. And so I'm entreating the people who are willing to listen to me to pursue better ideas in order to, to choose to become better people. And in so doing, that will make a better world for me and for the people that I love and the people that I leave behind after I die. But so far there hasn't been much in the way of cash inflow from my efforts. And so far, certainly there haven't been any vast hordes of people who have changed their views because of arguments that I've made. And it's easily foreseeable to me that that may never happen or certainly will not happen in my lifetime, but it may never happen at all. I could be casting bread upon the waters in the hopes that it will come back a thousandfold, but I, at the same time I could be casting pearls before swine. And I'm not calling you swine, and I'm not calling the other people who are not watching this video swine, but the world is full of ideas, it's full of information, it's full of noise, and most of that noise is much better produced than the videos that I'm making. I don't think there are very many people who have trod the earth who write better than I do, but writing well in an illiterate world turns out to be a very poor strategy for changing minds. And even among people who are very, very literate, there is an enormous amount of competition for their attention as well. I'm clearly not all that good at attracting the attention that I need. I need to be much more belligerent, much more disputatious, much more contentious, much more whiny, much more we're all in this together, all of the things that I despise in other people's approaches to philosophical recruitment. And accordingly, I have no reason to despair over my failure to attract millions of adherents to my ideas. And yet, I have hope. I live in a world of hope. And regardless of how my hopes turn out, I hope to improve my own mind. And that I will do with you or without you. And I've got my whole life as proof. I've got man alive as proof. And I've got all the work that I've done in the four years since the publication of Man Alive as proof that my mind will improve for as long as it exists on this earth. And your mind is your business, your problem, yours to deal with. Yours to thrive with if you do and yours to suffer with if you make the wrong choices. I think I have better ideas. I think I can lead you to better choices. But what you do about that is up to you. You're in this all alone. Thanks for attending me today and for all these years, and I'll talk to you again soon.